Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Charlie Hill. I'm on the uh, public policy team here at Google, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Parag Khanna to Google. Uh, Parag is an international best-selling author and senior fellow at the New American Foundation. He owns, holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and a bachelor's and master's from School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. He's held senior positions to the US Special Ops Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's really impressive. Uh, at the Brookings Institute, Council on Foreign Relations, and the World Economic Forum. His latest book cannot be more timely, How to Run the World, Charting a Course to the Next Renaissance. In an article posted on CNN.com today, Parag states, quote, since the WikiLeaks scandal exploded to, at the end of last year, many commentators have declared this episode marks the end of, end of diplomacy. Nonsense. Technology and capitalism are driving diplomacy in fascinating new directions, but not for the first time. It was well before WikiLeaks that the who, what, when, where, and why, and how of diplomacy were thrown into flux. Our CEO, Eric, has been quoted as saying that we need to pay attention to Parag's ideas, um, and I'm sure he would prefer that I stop talking. Uh, one last note, we just uh, had a long session where we discovered that Prag is a fellow MAPS dork. Um, we talked about geopolitics, and it was fascinating. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Prague. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming and taking time out of your day uh, to be here. I think you know a, a book titled "How to Run the World" is so appropriate for for Google, since uh, in some ways I guess I must must just be telling you what you already know, uh, because uh, outside this building, within it, more than enough people believe that that's exactly uh, the case. Um, and funny enough, about six or seven years ago, I was uh, sitting around in, in Washington with a good friend of mine, uh, Ernie Wilson, who's the dean of the now is the dean of the Annenberg School uh, at the University of Southern California, and he and I were doing what what policy wonks do, which is figure out ways to run the world. And we started uh, thinking about the ways in which uh, the technology companies were uh, having such an impact on major issues of the day, innovation, job creation, freedom of information, and so forth all over the world. And, and that we started uh, kind of you know, writing a, a policy paper around this, which was uh, never published, unfortunately. But, but it was, uh, would have been quite prescient, because uh, take a guess what the title of that paper was uh, six or seven years ago. It was titled Google's Foreign Policy. Uh, but unfortunately, never never made it uh, to to the market. But now, seven years later, as all of you know, Google is uh, a diplomatic player. Uh, you are so intimately involved in precisely those issues that we were thinking about um, writing about some years ago, uh, and the fact that there is something called a corporate foreign policy, or that a company like Google, or even uh, nuts and bolts companies, or General Motors, or defense industry, oil companies, and so forth, that they have their own foreign policies, that they're out there around the world changing facts on the ground, negotiating their own relationships and deals, and going about and doing it first, and then worrying about whether or not they're coordinated with their own home country government, uh, even the notion of home country government has become, in many cases, antiquated. That is, uh, that, that strikes people as strange. And one of the purposes of this book is to point out that it's always been the case that uh, individual authorities, whether they are companies or universities uh, or humanitarian actors, NGOs, religious groups, have always conducted their own foreign policies. And we're now re-entering uh, a period of history where that is happening really in, in, in overdrive. And so how does this all come back to uh, diplomacy, which is really the central concept of this book? And the reason why I chose this, this very modest title for the book, uh, How to Run the World, uh, is because I believe that actually that question has a one word answer. And that word is, in fact, diplomacy. Now, if you were to ask people, give me a one word answer for how to run the world, they might say war, conquest, domination, you know, all of these sorts of uh, concepts, hegemony, you know, by the way, we, we think. Uh, that, that, that empires, superpowers, are actually managed to order world affairs. But none of those things, all of those are one-off solutions, sort of silver bullets. Um, what diplomacy is that's different from those other concepts is that it's a process. Running, how to run the world, the operative word here is run, not rule uh, or ruin, um, but run. It means a process, a system, a management sort of mode. 
And only diplomacy offers that. Only diplomacy is the constant process of negotiation and interaction and dialogue among authorities, whether they are companies, whether they are governments, whether they are NGOs, whether they are religious groups, whether they come from the .com world, the .gov world, the .edu world, or the .god world, as I like to say. Um, that constant negotiation that's going on, that is diplomacy. And you are as much a part of that, as you all know, um, as anyone else, and sometimes more prominently than many countries are. And the fact that we are in this world where all of a sudden we can think of private actors like Google uh, or, um, or other companies being as or more important than certain governments, again, strikes people as, as unique and unprecedented. And yet it's, it's not. Um, in fact, uh, this landscape looks a lot like the world of a 1,000 years ago in the Middle Ages. Now, of course, that was a less technologically enhanced uh, era. But it had certain uh, amazing, striking commonalities uh, with the world today that I think are worth reflecting on before we simply uh, you know, leap into the notion that we are in, um, in a sort of new world order. And the first is that that was a multipolar world. Uh, China, as you all know, is uh, very much uh, becoming a superpower today. Um, and it was a 1,000 years ago. The, the Song Dynasty was the most advanced civilization. Uh, India is a rising power. And India, a 1,000 years ago, uh, under the Chola Dynasty, was a very powerful naval uh, force. Uh, the Arab Islamic uh, worlds today that are, that are resurgent, a 1,000 years ago was the time of the great caliphates that ruled from North Africa through Central Asia. The reason we think of the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages in the Western world uh, is largely because, of course, the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire were very weak. Uh, and of course, this was, uh, this was certainly a, a, a dark period uh, from the Western standpoint. It was a time of uh, uh, great poverty, plagues, crusades, a uh, tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, that, that ruled in uh, Western Europe and so forth at the time. But for others, remember, it was a golden age. So in that sense, when we look at the world today and we see how multipolar it is, clearly it's not the first time. It's not only a multipolar world, it's a multi-civilizational world. Uh, it's not just uh, ordered by Western powers, the United States or, or European countries, but truly it is um, powers distributed around the world. And then the second reason why the world seems very medieval uh, to me is because of the role of private actors. Because that was a time uh, before the rise of the modern nation state, before international law, before countries and nations uh, as we know them today. At that period of history, religious groups, private mercenary armies, professional merchant guilds, uh, all the un universities, the great universities of, uh, of the world, uh, from Bologna to Oxford, were founded in exactly that period a 1,000 years ago, um, were all independent actors. They all, again, pursued their own diplomatic relationships, again, much like today. So a multi-level, multi-layered sort of uh, a world in which there's overlapping and competing authorities, and everyone has their own foreign policy, it actually isn't new. What we live in today is basically the Middle Ages on steroids. And the notion that, uh, again, you, know, you raised the example, uh, Charlie, of WikiLeaks. The notion that WikiLeaks spells the end of diplomacy, the end of uh, that need for formal dialogue and communication and negotiation among all of the, these, uh, these players has been heard before. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, it's an episode I have uh, in this book, Lord Pal Palmerston uh, received the first uh, telegraph cable uh, at Whitehall in London, and he said, this is the end of diplomacy. Why would he need ambassadors anymore? Why would he need messages to come from abroad? It's just you know, this cable zaps it away. You don't even need the people. Um, and uh, even as recently as a few decades ago, as a big new Brzezinski, when he was uh, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, said, what are, what are all these embassies and, and foreign service officers doing out there? I just need a subscription to the New York Times. Because he felt that correspondents from the media were doing a better job of providing him information than his own uh, diplomats and representatives. But so clearly, diplomacy adapts. There's a joke about diplomacy. It's the second oldest prof profession. You know, it long predates the nation state, it will long outlive it, and it will continue to be more and more important in a world where there are even more diplomatic players. Because it's so easy to say, well, diplomacy is just those 200 nation states and the relations they have with each other. Everything else, that's just chaos. Well, that chaos is much more of the system than the relations between those couple hundred uh, countries. Because there's 50,000 transnational corporations out there, 
many of which are American, many of which are not. They all go out scouring the world for, uh, for supply chains, natural resources, uh, other kinds of relationships that they build. Uh, and they do that with states, but they also do it with other companies. There are tens of thousands of transnational NGOs as well. They are the ones that help to uh, provide welfare for, uh, for refugees, for starving people, uh, and, and pursue human rights agendas and other things all over the world. They, too, aren't asking for permission from anyone to do what they do. And in this world, they're increasingly mobile. They can relocate. Uh, they can, uh, like Halliburton, can move its headquarters uh, from the United States to Dubai if it wants to. Uh, so the fact that these are not only independent entities but multinodal and transnational and located everywhere, that is much more a feature of the world today than the static map of nation states and the diplomacy that occurs among them. And it's amazing to see the extent to which today we are in a world where everyone has their own sort of foreign policy. And of course, we will talk a lot more about Google's uh, foreign policy, as it were. But beyond just uh, Google, uh, if you look at, for example, um, you know, Walmart. Uh, Walmart is a, a, co a company that is often frowned upon uh, in the United States, but uh, very welcome, actually, um, in many, many parts of the world. It creates jobs uh, for, for women in many cases. It provides goods and so forth. Uh, so all over the world, you find that Walmart is one of the most welcome uh, companies, no matter what our opinion is of it here. So it raises an interesting point about the role of the CEO. Uh, is the CEO just the CEO of a company who's only responsible to shareholders? I don't think that your CEO thinks that. Uh, he certainly doesn't. Uh, CEOs are statesmen. CEOs are statesmen every bit as much as presidents are statesmen today. And if you go to gatherings like the World Economic Forum at Davos, which is taking place next week, you find that CEOs are very much treated that way. That's why it's such an interesting and important gathering, because there they negotiate not only with other CEOs, but with government executives. There's a, uh, there's a, a saying by a famous sociologist, Ulrich Beck. He says, the only thing worse than being overrun by multinationals, you know, you're familiar with Poor countries getting getting really barreled over by companies that are coming and, and uh, you know sucking up their resources or, or and exploiting them. He says the only thing worse than that is to not be overrun by multinationals. And at a place like Davos, you see countries lining up, dozens of them, really begging to have a meeting with uh, with Eric Schmidt or with Bill Gates or or you know other CEOs because they want that investment, they want those IT parks, they want that technology, they want those contracts, they want their workers educated, they want those institutes, all those things that American uh, companies and universities bring to the table. So CEOs are statesmen, and the most prominent CEOs out there, uh, your own, whether it's uh, George Soros or Bill Gates or Richard Branson, these are all people who look well beyond just the bottom line of the firm. They realize that companies are very much a part of providing world order, providing what we call public goods, except the word public goods doesn't really make sense anymore because the word public goods, the term, connotes that there is something inherently governmental that only governments can and should provide for security, education, health care, all of these kinds of things. A lot of things that you get right here on this campus, actually, um, uh, of, of this company. And it's provided to you by a company. I think that what has changed psychologically in the world is that uh, many, many people don't really expect governments to provide these things for them at all. They're looking for whatever the nearest, most proximate power or authority is that can do it. And so if you are a resident of a slum of southern Lebanon, that's Hezbollah. It's not your government. It's a political party, an armed group. It's a variety. It's a it's a it's a mixture of things into one. Uh, and if it is um, in Sudan or in Chad or in other parts of Africa, it's going to be Oxfam or Save the Children or UNICEF. Uh, but it's not likely to be your own government. So the notion that there is something called the state and that there are 200 of them, they are equally coherent and competent and able to provide public goods, and that they constitute. Uh, you know, sort of uh, public welfare, or even theoretically, is completely false. In practice, I think a lot of you are familiar with this reality, but the fact that theory hasn't caught up, whether it's the theory of diplomacy, of geopolitics, international relations, the fact that that hasn't caught up is actually what's, uh, what's motivated me to write this book. Another motivation is that I see the power of inertia holding us back from embracing this new diplomatic baseline, this new reality of a chaotic world, but a world in which there's so many more resources available to solve problems. Because again, if we, do, if we are dictated by inertia, if we do believe that it really is governments that are going to solve problems, then we reach to, to silver bullets. We think, 
uh, the United Nations is the place to deal with global security problems. Let's go to the UN Security Council for South Sudan, for Iran, whatever the case may be. And we need to expand that Security Council from 15 members to 25 or 30 members, and that will lead to a solution. That's kind of silver bullet thinking that I find highly uh, problematic. And there's many examples of it. Right now, uh, Barack Obama and Hu Jintao are having um, their, their summit in Washington. And it's lead people, led people to say, well, America may not run the world anymore, but we have a G2 two countries, the US and China. Let them just hash it out. You know, uh, even, if they, even if these kinds of summits uh, are inconclusive, uh, this G2 represents the two centers of power. They just need to agree on currency, on climate, on uh, human rights, on a variety of things, and the world will again be a stable place. Again, silver bullet thinking that's going to wind up proving disastrously wrong. Not just the G2, G2 how about the G20? A lot of people call the G20 a steering committee for the world. Uh, they say, look, it's so legitimate. It has the 20... Um, 20 of the largest economies in the world that represent 80% uh, of the world's population as well. And yet, look what happens when this neat, simple group of 20 countries get together. Well, almost nothing. Uh, they're not able to agree on even the most minimal kinds of issues, like uh, financial sector regulation and things like this. So that's yet another silver bullet that will prove uh, to be uh, fruitless. Um, and so instead of that, Instead of that, what I'm advocating is a kind of diplomacy that is really uh, the antithesis of silver bullets, one that doesn't look to one government, to one international organization uh, to solve problems, because that would, be, that would be the book called How to Rule the World. And that's not what this is about. This is a book about the process. I believe that we need what I call a mega diplomacy or a wiki diplomacy, in which you crowdsource a lot more, in which you take advantage of the fact that, yes, it's a chaotic, anarchic kind of situation, but you have more resources on the table than you've ever had before. You have more companies, more governments, more NGOs willing to provide resources to confront global challenges, whether it's security issues like terrorism, or whether it is climate change, whether it's poverty, whether it's providing public health than ever before. But we, what we don't have is a good process to harness it. In fact, we have uh, um, a real disaster of a process. We have deadlock, we have stovepipes, we have siloed thinking and bureaucracies. We have a kind of mosh pit. If you look at Haiti today, for example, where the devastating earthquake took place a year ago, you have everyone sending uh, their resources. You have 10 trucks with supplies showing up at one place. You don't have a good process that helps to create a division of labor. Uh, by which there, is, there are um, commensurate contributions, by which there's coordination among these different actors um, on the ground. If we had a better process, if we had a better diplomatic system that harnessed these resources, I think we would be a lot closer to being in a more, more stable, peaceful, prosperous kind of world. So what does mega diplomacy look like in practice? And that's what I try to uh, spell out in this book. What are the real principles uh, that, that, that govern it? And the first is uh, inclusion. Now, as I said, it's not just .gov anymore when it comes to running the world. It's also the .coms, the .orgs, uh, the .edus, uh, and the .gods. Uh, all of them need. All of them have resources. All of them are willing to to contribute. Um, thinking about how to build coalitions among them is the first step. Not presuming that there is a world environment organization for one thing and a world human rights organization and so forth. So inclusion is uh, one of the most uh, important sort of uh, elements of good mega diplomacy. Another is decentralization. We have a tendency in diplomatic thinking and in this field called global governance to want to centralize uh, authority, to say, when you have a financial crisis and people are vulnerable, let's put $5 billion into a vulnerability fund, right? We have a climate change problem. Well, we need to create a global environment organization. Uh, again, we have security problems. We'll need to strengthen the UN Security Council in New York. And I am always against those centralized silver bullets, as I mentioned earlier. Instead, I want to decentralize. The governing principle of all global governance should be good local governance, spreading resources and capacity as far and wide as you can. To me, having 200,000 UN peacekeepers instead of 100,000 is not evidence of better global governance. To me, having a stronger African Union with its own peacekeeping force to manage African problems and a better Arab peacekeeping force to deal with Arab conflicts 
and a better Asian or Southeast Asian peacekeeping force to deal with uh, Asian uh, disputes is a much better model than a centralized one. So decentralization of resources is, uh, is the next principle. The third principle of good mega diplomacy is mutual accountability. There's a lot of critique of the positive things that NGOs and companies do, and you've heard it all, you've heard them, you've heard num first, first and foremost, that you're not democratic. A company isn't democratic. It's responsible to shareholders, not to citizens. What about NGOs? You know, who is the Gates the Foundation accountable to? It spends all this money everywhere. It runs its own programs. Who can, who can vote them out? We can vote our bums out, right, every four years. But all of these private actors, they're not accountable. Well, we're never going to square that circle in terms of making uh, NGOs or companies democratically accountable. The, even the term democratic accountability only applies to democratic polities such as the United States. And only half the countries in the world are even meaningful democracies anyway. So we have to be much more imaginative in how we think about accountability. So to me, that third principle of good mega diplomacy is mutual accountability. It's situational. It's contractual. It's when uh, it's when the Gates Foundation, to take a uh, previous example, goes into uh, to Botswana and says, you know, you have a major uh, AIDS crisis. We're going to work with you to bring in vaccines, to bring in medications, to train local uh, health workers uh, and, um, and help to uh, alleviate this problem. There is a promise made, a commitment made. It's being monitored by the government. It's being monitored by NGOs. It's being monitored by the media and others. That creates a real-time mutual accountability based on the commitments that are made. And Governments need to be monitored in terms of fulfilling their commitments every bit as much as companies do. Uh, most governments in the world, this is not a surprise to you, I'm sure, are, are very, very corrupt as well. They don't really deliver on their pledges either. Where is the accountability for them and on them? Often their citizens are too weak and disempowered to actually impose accountability on their governments. Mutual accountability is a much better way forward. So those are the three kinds of um, you know, principles uh, that, that to me mentally should govern uh, mega diplomacy. And I think it can play out in so many interesting ways that are so different from what we have been doing in, uh, in problem after problem. And we, we're really just fumbling through a lot of these right now. I mentioned earlier the case of a very, very hard security question, which is regional security and peacekeeping and actual military interventions in places like uh, in places like Darfur and Sudan and the need to allow and empower local forces to be able to to go about and do that there's a secondary part of that which is once you do have uh, you know uh, independence movements and secessionist movements such as uh, South Sudan which create independent countries what do you do then how do you create a peaceful region uh, in Africa, or in places like Central Asia, or in the Middle East, where border disputes still reign. Well, that's where, interestingly enough, the solution doesn't lie so much with just governments and armies. It lies so much with companies and NGOs. And the, and the reason is because of infrastructure. Uh, I believe that the only way that you are going to re rehabilitate certain areas, take the example of Afghanistan, uh, is by building infrastructure and linking this landlocked country, this very poor landlocked country, to its neighbors and to uh, coastal areas so that it can export goods. The US military alone can't do that. In fact, in the last 10 years that we've been in Afghanistan, uh, and, and as we know, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of progress in stabilizing uh, that country. Um, only recently, only in the last one year, has the Defense Department created something called the Office of Business and Stabilization Operations. And what that office does is to say, here we are in Herat province, here we are in southern Afghanistan. It's not just a question of how many troops can we put there to quiet the situation. Now what they're thinking is, how do we bring in American companies? How can they build it? How can they create jobs here? How can they build a factory here? How can we get more roads built? How about some pipeline projects going from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan and so forth? Now they're realizing that without private sector investment, without stimulating business, things that companies do, and you have to bring the companies in to do it, are you ever actually going to stabilize that country? And that's just one example. That's just Afghanistan. The same situation applies in Iraq same situation in Sudan, the same situation in some of the hot spots, failed states, Somalia, Yemen. There is no end uh, to the number of places that, uh, that really do need this kind of mega diplomatic strategy to be militarily, politically stabilized, but also economically stable and fruitful so that you actually don't have to keep on and on intervening. Again, it takes mega diplomacy, not just traditional modes of intervention and engagement.
this company is obviously you know at the forefront of one of the one of the hot button uh, global agenda questions in diplomacy, and that's uh, human rights, uh, freedom of information, and so forth. And probably not originally. Um, you know, by, by design or desire to have been caught up in the situation that you were. But it's such an interesting example of um, a pattern that has actually been visible for a long time. Because when it comes to human rights, and, when, and uh, where we have long relied on the promotion of declarations, like the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have found that actual progress in internalizing those global codes and regulations and laws has been very, very weak. In fact, uh, you know, there's a lot of academic work that shows just how poor actual implementation of human rights has been. And that has a lot to do with the fact that the United Nations itself is the body that we look to to promote things, and yet it is a club of countries, of governments, that respect each other's sovereignty or are supposed to, and therefore can't, can only go so far in criticizing each other. Uh, so how could you ever have a UN resolution criticizing China's human rights policy in uh, Tibet, for example? You can't, and you never will, because China is a member of that United Nations. So you find that when it comes to promoting uh, human rights, good governance, uh, anti-corruption types of things, uh, by and large, uh, what progress we do see is driven so much, actually, by, uh, by, by citizens groups, by NGOs, by companies, and so forth. And, and Google is, of course, uh, one of them. And I want to give you a couple of examples of how this operates in practice, um, you know, non non Google examples, and I'll give you the example of um, a business for social responsibility. This is an NGO that had about six or seven people on the ground in Beijing. Today, it has fifty people in in uh, China uh, and growing fast. And what they are allowed to do is to go inside Chinese companies, state-owned Chinese companies, and work to improve labor uh, conditions in factories and to work on improving uh, uh, quality of uh, workforce and training and supply chains. Uh, so this is an NGO that's able to do these things. It's not something that the U.S. government is allowed to do. When was the last time the Chinese government released a political prisoner because a high-level American diplomat was going to China? Not probably since the 1990s, not since uh, most of you were in uh, you know, middle school or elementary school. They don't do that anymore. They're too confident to allow it. But what they do allow is what I call functional activism, doing something that helps them make themselves a better country, a better society, uh, than uh, a better, more functioning uh, government than they are right now. Um, there's another example, uh, International Bridges for Justice. Uh, this is a very small uh, NGO that is based in uh, Geneva and started by a Canadian. What they are allowed to do is actually go inside Chinese prisons and to post uh, political rights of prisoners there, uh, and they do it in, uh, in local languages in other countries in Southeast Asia as well. I can't really imagine governmental diplomats being able to do that either. Uh, so the ways in which uh, the human rights community uh, in, from, the, from, the, from civil society is able to affect uh, some of these major issues is so substantial. And then, of course, there is technology, technology companies, uh, mobile phones, uh, Twitter, and so forth. Within 10 years' time, Almost every person in the world will either have their own mobile phone or access to a mobile phone at the family unit level or at the village level. We've only just begun to see with Twitter revolutions and so forth, we've really only begun to see uh, the impact that that can have. But we have seen already how it generates economic growth with farmers and fishermen able to see market prices for their goods uh, and the ways in which they're able to share information uh, through text messaging uh, to file complaints, uh, corruption complaints, which can be geolocated uh, through through software that's out there, and uh, and things like this. So the role of uh, the role of technology in uh, in human rights is is absolutely fundamental, and it's something that's driven as much or more by companies than by official uh, foreign policy. It's only now. Uh, really in, in re recent couple of years uh, and, and certainly motivated partially by uh, your experience uh, in China that the State Department is thinking so much more seriously about these things. There's another vital area and that's just the global economy. Job creation might be the biggest threat facing political stability all over the world. Most of the world's population now is, uh, is you know, under the age of 25 or 30 almost in, in, in very much th that's very much the case in, uh, in a politically unstable emerging market developing countries, the Middle East, Africa, and so forth. Um, how they are able to create jobs is going to dictate their future. It's not even so much is uh, Ben Ali the president of Tunisia one day and not the next day or not. It's 
how many companies, multinationals, otherwise, are in that country creating jobs uh, for the people or not. And uh, that's, again, an area where companies play a vital role. What I have found in country after country, especially in the Middle East, is that they're not all that interested in having a lecture from uh, someone from uh, the embassy or from a visiting uh, State Department official. But I'll be damned if they don't want uh, Eric Schmidt to come and visit them. Uh, they want CEOs. Uh, they want job creators, they want factories, uh, they want uh, resources. And it's companies that are giving that to them. And this you can see all over the Middle East. There are technology parks sprouting up, uh, and, and you are part of that, and other companies are part of that, which are absolutely essential to creating a better future for these societies. And it doesn't happen, again, just because the government told you to do it. You're out there looking for markets and opportunities. The American uh, edu higher education community is a great example of this, because at a time when uh, the image of the United States and the Middle East and relations between the U.S. and the Arab world uh, have, could not be any lower than they have been in the last decade. This is precisely the last seven or eight years in which American universities uh, from, from all over, Cornell, Georgetown, Texas A&M, Carnegie Mellon, you name it, have set up pretty sizable presence in campus, campuses in, uh, in, in, uh, in Doha, in Qatar, in Abu Dhabi, in the United Arab Emirates, very much welcomed by the host governments because through that process, you are educating uh, the next generation of these countries. It is having impact on women's rights. It is having impact on political norms in these countries. And it's being spearheaded very much by what is uh, really one of the one of the most um, strongest aspects of American society, which is our higher educational system. Which really brings me back to the point about foreign policy, corporate foreign policy or NGO foreign policy. The image of America in the world is so often thought to be synonymous with uh, whether or not our government's policy, uh, the Defense Department, the State Department, whether or not they are doing a good job or a bad job in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, or whether or not Obama is liked or disliked around the world. But that's not what America's footprint in the world is, not even close. The footprint of American society is far, far, far larger around the world than the footprint of the American government. Footprint of American society is all of our companies and brands and all of the sales uh, and markets that they have all over the world. It is the role of our educational system in uh, training many of the world's elite and in setting up these campuses all over the world. It's the fact that um, the American population, citizen for citizen, the 300 million of us on average, uh, on average are the most generous people uh, in the entire world in terms of charitable giving, uh, foundations and other types of assistance. It's the fact that this is the, this country is the largest source of remittances in the entire world. So again, people to people, uh, diasporic uh, giving from uh, expatriates uh, in this country to uh, poor countries in the world, whether it is uh, the Philippines or India or Mexico. All of those things are uh, really demonstrate and underscore the greatness of America in ways that don't really correlate to the public opinion about um, about our government. And Google is very much a part of that, of all of Silicon Valley and all of the amazing uh, products that are generated here and the services that are and the way they're exported, the way they're internalized and captured and used by people all over the world. That is part of American foreign policy, whether or not you were asked to do so by the government or not. So what we, where the phase we're in now is where really the government, our government is uh, struggling very hard, even just to wrap its mind around the total volume and value of activity of our companies and of our NGOs, of our universities, uh, all over the world. And they find that, wow, they can't even really harness it. It's too much to even capture. So what we have is this, um, this amazing dynamism coming out of America that tells a very different story from those who believe that America may be in decline, America is losing relevance, America is losing influence. It may be that the government is in some ways and is in some ways isn't, but that's certainly not the case when it comes to American society. And I think that's the most important thing to remember in a world of mega diplomacy, that every one of you is a diplomat. Uh, I'm particularly optimistic, actually, because in a place like this where so many people are very young, I think that um, wiki diplomacy, mega diplomacy is something that, that everyone in this room just intuitively gets. You don't grow up thinking anymore that in order to do something diplomatic, to do something good for the world, 
to be part of constructing that better future, you have to go join the Foreign Service. By working for Google, you're inherently doing something diplomatic. By joining Oxfam or the Gates Foundation, or even running a corporate citizenship program for a major company, whether it's an investment bank or an oil company, you are absolutely a part of diplomacy. You are a health diplomat, you're an education diplomat, you are, uh, an, ed uh, you are an information diplomat. But whatever the case may be, all of you really are diplomats, and that is really why I with generational change and the, the fact that Generation Y, as it were, really intuitively gets this new landscape, very optimistic that we're going to see so much more P2P, people to people, and B2B, business to business, diplomacy and engagement across borders that's really going to turn this new Middle Ages into another renaissance. Uh, I'll stop right there and look forward to, uh, to taking your questions. Thanks very much. Right. I think it's a great question. Um, it's really, uh, the question was about uh, how do you really uh, ensure openness and accountability in, uh, in a mega diplomatic world of so many actors uh, doing their own thing. Um, and it's, it's really an ironic question because diplomacy has long been considered to be done something, is something that's done in secret. Right, so it never was open to begin with. So to expect diplomacy to have a component of openness at all is actually rather startling. It's kind of a sign of the times, I suppose, that, that, you would, uh, that you would ask that. And I certainly think it's very resonant. And it's, again, something that diplomacy needs to answer to and think about, especially in the age of, um, of WikiLeaks. Diplomacy has traditionally been thought to be about um, uh, establishing difference, affirming difference. I am representing my interests to you. I'm going to tell you what I think and what I want you to do, and you are going to do it or you're going to respond. This new mega diplomacy is something different. It's not about representing your differences. It's about affirming a certain kind of unity. Mega diplomatic coalitions only really come together voluntarily when people want to do it. The incentives are already in line. An NGO wants to deliver uh, public goods. The government doesn't have the manpower to do it, but can provide some financing. And, a, and a, a company can provide a certain amount of technology. Microsoft has something called NGO Connect. It helps humanitarian NGOs in humanitarian crisis areas uh, have a real-time platform to share uh, information about what resources they have in which locations and, and, and in that kind of way. So these coalitions are very organic. They're very ground up. There's a, a willingness that sort of is built into it to want to collaborate and to be sort of, you know, accountable to whatever commitments and promises they make. So to that extent, it, it sort of, uh, it partially answers the question about how you ensure these things. But in other ways, uh, the answer is a bit more passive, which is that um, it's an improvement on what we have now and that the results are whatever you see on the ground, whether or not it was done in a manner that satisfies any kind of test or accountability. We still rely to a great deal on, on shame on the media, on the, just the power of uh, outside uh, transparency and, and a light being shine, shown on what people are doing to produce that kind of accountability. And we still will in this world of mega diplomacy. The role of the media uh, is so important in highlighting uh, crises and disasters and, and trying to, in, in shaming governments to act with a conscious, uh, or, or not just uh, governments, but citizens as well, uh, to act or to change their behavior. And we're going to continue to rely on that as well. And that is going to be one of the forces also that pushes more of these coalitions into being. But you'll find that this situational accountability you know, doesn't seem all that satisfactory in theory. But in practice, you find that it actually works very, very well, because these coalitions tend to be short term. It's about achieving a specific purpose for a specific objective at a specific time. Uh, it's not about a grand declaration, which is then forgotten uh, 10 minutes later and never fulfilled. And so I think that in a way, uh, although it's, it's messy and you have more of them and they're more limited and time bound, they actually do achieve a lot more than our traditional diplomatic coalitions do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the question was about uh, Blackwater and private military companies. And um, that's certainly one of the symptoms of a medieval world. Because again, a thousand years ago, knights and mercenary armies roam free. They participated in the Crusades uh, for their own benefit to achieve uh, riches and booty. Um, and that is uh, certainly seems to be the case again today. So uh, it's a symptom of our neo-medievalism or some of these uh, private uh, uh, contractor firms that uh, you know hundreds of thousands of which, in terms of manpower, currently work for the United States. 
States government, but certainly for others as well. If the United States were to regulate that industry out of existence, which it doesn't have the courage or the resources or even the incentive to do right now because it needs them, uh, that industry wouldn't really suffer because it would just relocate its headquarters uh, to uh, to South Africa or to India or any number of other places where it's very welcome and active and profitable. So I'm afraid that the genie can't be put back in the bottle. The only question is how do you, again, monitor it, make it accountable, leverage it even to some extent. There's an episode I describe in this book in which a very famous uh, actress uh, consulted Blackwater to see if they would be willing to go into Darfur and to stop the uh, Janjaweed militias uh, from their brutal assaults on the Darfur population. And uh, they said, yes, absolutely. You know, and they just kind of named a price. Um, and the scary thing, I think, or, or what is scarier, is it scary to think that, wow, they could do that and a private citizen could pay a private army to stop, uh, you know, sort of a war or genocide? Or actually, is it scarier to think that we don't do it? Because after all, I mean, the, the, the human rights violations, the genocidal campaigns are continuing. And actually, there's a company right there that'll stop it, even though the UN Security Council won't mandate an intervention. And so I think that we should really wrestle with the, the, this dilemma rather than inherently presume that a private company with war fighting capability is a bad thing. Because if they're paid by the right person, such as by NGOs that pay them all the time uh, to help them get into, into the places that they need to be to deliver supplies already. I mean, again, altruism and profit are already going hand in hand. NGOs in Afghanistan, Somalia, all over the world are paying these same companies. Uh, maybe they get a discounted rate. I don't know. Uh, but to get what they, what, you know, these, these, uh, to make humanitarian deliveries. So I don't think it's going to go away. I think that there's good examples of how to harness it. I think we should look, look, look at those as much as we can. Uh, Crystal. So the, the question is if uh, mega diplomacy can be applied to certain intractable uh, conflicts, and there, there are so many of these, um, of these border disputes out there. Um, you know, obviously, you know, if you take the case of uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, there is a, there is a corridor linking Nagorno-Karabakh uh, to Armenia, and, and there's um, ongoing political you know, sort of dialogue about whether or not there can be some normalization or return of the territory or some kind of political status of autonomy. These kinds of things are always being negotiate. But at the end of the day, my, my finding is that if you can, can determine a political status and then move beyond the political issue towards economic ones, you'll have a certain integration and rehabilitation. And the best example of this, I believe, is, or the best two examples are Kurdistan and uh, Palestine. So today, Palestine is, is very much divided into, uh, into uh, or the, the putative Palestinian state divided into Gaza and the West Bank without that corridor linking them. And so the Rand Corporation came up with this proposal called the Ark, in which you would have this uh, trunk, this J-shaped trunk of uh, railways, uh, road, uh, or commuter transit, uh, irrigation, sanitation, uh, services, bus lines that would all the way from northern West Bank all the way to, to Gaza uh, City, to the port, um, develop, uh, develop, a, develop a, a seaport, an airport, other things that would allow the Palestinian state to have an economic uh, lifeline and existence of its own and not be as dependent on aid from the European Union or from the U.S. or the U.N., and if and when that would happen, you would probably find that that state would want to trade with its neighbors, uh, particularly Israel. You know, and you would be move beyond the kind of political stamina that you have today. It would require that you have an independent state, because my argument is that you first have to have that independence or clear status, even if it's autonomy, and then you can move forward with the things that actually help to diminish those uh, borders in the long run. Kurdistan is another good example. Uh, the the. Kurdistan regional government, KRG, of northern Iraq that occupies uh, only territory within Iraq, even though there are Kurds in the surrounding countries, um, wants independence. I mean, there is no doubt about it. The only question is when. They've sought independence for 3,000 years. I don't think that ended just because America invaded Iraq and wanted to create a unified, uh, democratic, multi-ethnic state. It's not going to happen. Uh, that, among many other dozens of countries, is in a slow state of uh, post-colonial entropy, as I call it. They are fragmented into much more natural sorts of parts, and Kurdistan is one of them. What Kurdistan is doing, even in the absence of independence right now, is moving ahead with the economic integration. The one country that you would think is the least uh, interested in having independent Kurdish state, which is Turkey, uh, is the one that's playing the biggest part in fueling that capacity building and infrastructure development in Kurdistan. All Turkish companies all the time, all over northern Iraq, working on the roads and the airports and other sorts of things. So it's amazing how... 
the commercial sector, mega diplomacy, and so forth, are actually doing a lot to rehabilitate that situation and create a new possibility. Because you would, I mean, anytime I'm in the region or, or elsewhere and, and I say there'll be an independent Kurdistan, people always say, the Turks will never allow it. And I say, really? Which Turks do you mean? Because every Turkish businessman I know is making money in Kurdistan right now. Uh, so the notion that uh, they probably just mean the Turkish military, right, which obviously has a reactive view on the situation. But I think there are many scenarios whereby uh, Turkey, Iran, Syria, and Iraq uh, the neighbors of Kurdistan ultimately do accept it because, after all, it would be a landlocked country, and landlocked countries have no choice but to get along with their neighbors and to trade with their neighbors. So, I do think mega diplomacy will play a very big part in resolving uh, border disputes. I have a question about your hearing. Right. No, it's a really good question about what incentives are necessary to uh, get companies uh, involved in promoting good governance and the fact that in so many failed states that incentive just doesn't seem to be there for companies to operate. Again, this is where mega diplomacy is actually really important. There are institutions within the international uh, framework, such as the uh, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, MIGA, or the IFC, the International Finance Corporation. These are actually parts of the World Bank uh, group, and what they do is to provide risk insurance mechanisms for companies to go into to, uh, to risky areas uh, where they may not generate high growth immediately, where there's very high startup costs, barriers to entry, corruption. They help to facilitate that kind of investment. So whether it's power grids or roads or airports, you find uh, you will find that uh, the MIGA and the IFC and from the U.S. government, OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment uh, uh, Company, uh, what they do is to actually provide those uh, risk backstops and risk insurance mechanisms that really do get companies to go into Afghanistan. Oil companies want to do it uh, anyway because they, they most certainly want to extract resources, uh, get it out to market, and generate profits. So uh, even as far back as uh, Afghanistan in the mid-90s under Taliban control, Unical was trying to negotiate with the Taliban to actually build this pipeline uh, from Turkmenistan across Afghanistan. It's been 16, 17 years since then, and uh, now we're talking about that as the major strategy of our government and the Afghan government to help to put uh, the Afghan economy on the map uh, as a transit route for that pipeline, 17 years after it was first uh, proposed uh, and, and pursued by an American oil company. So there is a tremendous amount of interest provided, uh, yes, that there is, uh, you know, sort of security uh, that, that is necessary. But that also requires, you know, partnerships in some way between uh, those on the ground that can build that infrastructure and those who protect it. And again, one is often private, the other is uh, public. Um, but I do think that, uh, that there's too many examples of it actually happening. And, you know, Tunisia was always rated the most competitive economy in the Arab world uh, because there was so much, uh, you know, sort of business activity and foreign investment in, in the country, even though it was very corrupt. Uh, so the truth is that uh, in, in almost in a gr rapidly growing number of countries in the world, even those that used to receive very little foreign investment, a very little uh, international private sector there, it's spreading everywhere. That's why you have companies saying, what's our Africa strategy? They never had to ask that before. You never heard, peop you never heard companies five years ago, 10 years ago saying, we need an Africa strategy. We have to get into those markets. They're not, not all of them are much less risky than they were before. Look at political instability across the continent, whether it is in West Africa on the Ivory Coast or in places like Angola, but they're going there anyway. They're taking those risks because they have to be part of the, of the growing markets in the world. So I think the conditions are very right, actually, for companies to take bigger risks than they have before. And there are public mechanisms that can help them do that. None of my argument is against governments or against states, that they're not important, that they're outdated, that they're antiquated. It's only that we need more, far more partnerships with them and other actors to, to get things done. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how much it would it would cost, but you know the United Nations itself has had um, an internal uh, debate and discussion about whether or not it should use um, these private uh, military uh, contractors uh, in certain situations where it doesn't have enough peacekeeping troops, where member com member states of the UN aren't willing to provide them. So it's being considered. It's being used, done by NGOs. It's being done by governments like the United States and others, and it's being uh, considered. Uh, by the UN itself. So it kind of goes back to the previous uh, question. This is really a feature um, of, of the new world politics that, that's here to stay. It's a resource. I mean, military power, uh, weaponry, and an army, the ability to stop uh, a conflict or to start one is 
sort of neutrally speaking, just a resource. The question is who captures it, who uses it, and, and how. And I still think there are many there are ways to to harness it positively. And there there's two examples out there. There's a wealthy uh, Australian. Are you Australian? Yeah. So wealthy Australian uh, artist, I believe, who hired, who tried to hire Blackwater to stop uh, Japanese commercial whaling uh, near Australian waters because the Australian government wasn't doing it. But whaling in those waters is illegal. But who's stopping it? There's no international anti-whaling police force. So uh, this wealthy Australian artist said, I'm just going to hire them to do it. Uh, there's a very uh, famous NGO called Sea Shepherd, founded by Paul Watson, who was one of the original founders of Greenpeace. He's against whaling too, so he takes his own boats and he rams them into Japanese commercial whaling vessels. Uh, so there is usage of you know independent uh, contractors. The government of Puntland or of uh, Somaliland, I can't remember, these are also quasi-states actually, um, has been uh, working with uh, the anti-pirate private anti-piracy force of uh, Blackwater uh, to actually try and fend off international commercial fishing operations in their territorial waters, which have undercut uh, uh, their access to resources so that they can uh, they can grow their economies as well. So there's actually, uh, you know, very many governments and actors that are using these private forces. All right. Three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you so much.